All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 13, Section 5, Women's Rights. So one of the more important things to come out of the antebellum reform movement is the movement of women's rights. It's important to remember that we're talking about a time period in American history where women were prohibited from holding office, prohibited from voting. So in order to enact any sort of public change, women were very engaged in reform movements, whether that was the abolitionist movement, the temperance movement, whatever that movement may be, uh, other various moral reform movements. And it was sort of within those movements that women with the same or similar experience took up the cause of women's rights. So we might say that out of the antebellum reform movement, so out of various antebellum reforms or antebellum uh, reform movements, came the movement for women's rights. And a good example of this is the case of the Grimke sisters, Sarah and Angelina Grimke. Initially, they were abolitionists, right? So we'll say they were abolitionists. And they gave public lectures on the evils of slavery and advocating for its end. However, during these lectures, they oftentimes would find themselves just defending the fact that they were women and had a public platform to speak. Not only is this a time period where women are prohibited from voting or holding office, but stereotypes also really prohibit women from having a public voice. And so the issue of women's rights, in some sense, took precedence to the issue over, uh, you know, over abolition or temperance or whatever it was. It opened up a conversation or opened up a dialogue in thinking about what is a woman's role in society. Um, and really what we mean is in the public, right? How public should it be? And so people like Sarah and Angelina Grimke went from talking instead about the abolition of slavery, went to talking about issues related to the women's rights movement. Uh, those that, um, you know, sort of uh, took up this cause uh, labeled it or called it feminism. Feminism is simply just kind of another word for, you know, advocating for women's rights. Uh, again, we're talking about a wide variety of issues, whether it's the right to vote, the right to hold property, um, the right to represent one in court, uh, battling stereotypes, you know, exactly this question of, uh, you know, what the role of women should be in society. So it could take on a lot of different fronts, but the first women's rights convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. Again, we call this the first, there were, you know, there may have been some before this, but this is typically um, understood 1848 as the first women's rights uh, convention. And it included other pioneers of the women's rights movement like Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone. The story of Stanton also is a good example of how this movement came out of earlier reforms. She was an abolitionist along with her husband. She traveled all the way to London to go to an abolitionist or anti-slavery exposition, and they wouldn't let her in because she was a woman. And it was from that point that, you know, the, the cause of women's rights, um, you know, she became a, a women's rights advocate as opposed to an abolitionist advocate. And that was a similar experience that um, many of these women, uh, women had. So we might call them, we call them the pioneers of the women's rights movement. And at Seneca Falls, uh, a declaration of sentiments was created it was drafted very similar to the Declaration of Independence, right? So it was inspired by the words that Jefferson had written. Um, it stated that, you know, like Jefferson, all men and women are created equal, as opposed to the Declaration, which just said men, although Jefferson probably, probably meant men as in mankind. 
um, but also said that it was, you know, uh, Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence stated that it was, you know, uh, the British who had exercised tyranny over the colonies. Uh, in the Declaration of Sentiments, it states that men exercise tyranny over women and that it is the cause of the women's rights movements to, um, you know, to right that wrong. Uh, and so this is the beginning of the movement. So this is a movement that continues in the United States up through the Civil War and afterwards. One important thing that was established at Seneca Falls was to place the emphasis on suffrage. Like I said, you know, this was uh, women's rights was an issue that had a wide variety of arenas that it could play out. But, uh, you know, those who considered themselves suffragettes were, um, you know, kind of putting the, uh, the, the goalposts in place for what would be measured as equality, and that was the right to vote. National suffrage didn't happen in the United States until 1920, so a very long ways from 1848 all the way until 1920. Um, others use the stereotypical position of women in society to propel themselves into the public sphere. For the most part, we're talking about an American culture which considers the public sphere to be, um, you know, sort of a male-only sphere, the domestic sphere to be a female-only sphere. Um, however, there was also, with that stereotype, that women, in a sense, were in control of what was moral in society. They were the guardians of morality. Um, the private, the home area was moral. The public was immoral. And so people like Catherine Beecher and others said, well, the solution or the antidote to an immoral society is to allow women to have a greater role in public society. So it continued to sort of feed into the stereotypes of the day, but was leveraged into uh, getting women more influence in the public. One thing that Catherine Beecher advocated for was uh, education specifically more for women so they could be in charge of raising the next generation of Americans. Catherine Beecher, she's the daughter of Protestant preacher Lehman Beecher, wrote The Duty of American Women to Their Country. We might say about this advocated women's education.